I recently had the opportunity to spend five years leading America's humanitarian efforts around the world as the administrator for the U.S. Agency for International Development. USAID was created by President John F. Kennedy to make sure that our foreign policy reflected the best of our values for compassion to others and especially those who live in poverty and suffer from want. When I got the position, I was particularly excited about this opportunity. Uh, in fact, I had worked meticulously to create a 100-day plan to listen carefully to our 10,000 staff around the world to develop new programs and initiatives that would help us accelerate the fight to end hunger and save children from preventable deaths from diseases we knew how to cure and we knew how to prevent. So I came in the Monday after my swearing in, super excited to get going with that plan. By Tuesday, we had to throw the plan out the window. The reason was, in a minute, Tens of thousands of Haitians died in a tragic earthquake in Port-au-Prince, just 200 miles from the United States border. President Obama called, actually my first presidential phone call, I was nervous to receive that, and asked me to lead all of the elements of our government and our country's response to take care of people at their time of deep, significant suffering. I was nervous. But I was also overwhelmed by the task ahead. And you know, I was very new to this. So the first time I'd ever even walked into our emergency operations center was just the day before. And thankfully, I had. When we got going, it turns out we had a lot of capability and talent we could bring to help make a huge difference at people's time of real need. Our efforts helped to rescue people through urban search and rescue teams. We had the most productive search and rescue operation ever mounted. Within days, we had stood up a food distribution that reached almost two million people inside of Port-au-Prince and more than a million people around the country who otherwise would have gone hungry. We were able to get water, clean water, to people so effectively that in fact, six months after the earthquake, the diarrheal disease rate in Port-au-Prince was actually lower than the day before the earthquake itself. And through all of this, as the new guy, I was asking lots of naive questions. How do we know if the planes can land and urban search and rescue teams can be deployed? How do we know how many people are in need from, for food and water? Are women and children safe at night when they've been displaced from their homes? And what I learned was that we didn't really have great data-driven answers to those questions. The humanitarian community simply didn't operate that way. And in this case, we were flying in the blind. Now, five years later, I had a chance in December to go back to Haiti. And I talked to the nurses in this photo who were caring for neonates and infants who had just been born. The good news is that the rate of acute malnutrition and hunger in that country is 50% lower today than it was before the earthquake. The rate of children dying from simple diseases down more than 25% than before the earthquake. But what I came away with was a knowledge that Americans have tremendous compassion for others at their times of need, but also that we didn't have great systems that were data-driven for driving our response efforts. And that was driven home most acutely to me during the Somali famine of 2011. In fact, earthquakes are hard to see coming, but famines are not. We now have satellite imagery, on the ground photography, and other market price information that can help us predict when there's going to be trouble. And we knew throughout the spring of 2011 that in fact, in East Africa somewhere, 18 million people were gonna be at risk of food insecurity. But it's hard to act on that generalized information. The United Nations declared a famine in Somalia on July 20th. A famine is actually a declaration of death rate. That means two people per 1,000 die every single day. By the time the UN made its declaration, the death rate, almost exclusively children, in Somalia was three times that level. And this is what a famine looks like. These are women who have walked through hell 
for 40, 50 kilometers, carrying their children to safety at the Dadaab refugee camp. After talking to those women, I walked inside one of the medical facilities, and I met this young boy, and I was observing how his mother was helping him be fed, get nutrition through a nasogastric tube. I was so focused on the boy that it didn't occur to me, and I didn't realize until after we had asked some questions, that his younger brother had passed away earlier that day and was wrapped in a cloth on the cot right next to him. As tragic as that was, in that same moment of extreme pain and suffering, I saw hope. We effectively know now how to save children's lives at the most critical, dangerous moments. Ready-to-use medical foods can resuscitate kids much more effectively than ever before. We know that medical conditions are what actually kill children, and so we do a better job of getting great new vaccines to all of these kids when they were coming into the camp. And most importantly, we focused on getting data about where the problem was. We put more than 50 market price data collection folks in food markets throughout parts of Somalia. We saw most prices were elevated 50, 60 percent, but in a few places, they were up 250, 260 percent. That's where the famine was killing people. So we targeted those homes, got them vouchers, got them food, and the results are clear. The minute we started improving our data and our targeting, we had a steep reduction in child mortality, which is the top line in this graph. And I was so proud of our teams and our partners for their creativity and their focus on saving lives. But I also look back and wish we had a better system with real-time open information to ensure that those 35,000 children under that curve never died in the first place. Children like that boy on the cot. And this was brought home this past year when the Ebola crisis hit West Africa. The importance of early action is everything in a crisis like this. By the time young men and women were left in the streets to bleed and die, it was already too late to avoid the crisis. More than 30,000 people were infected. More than 10,000 died. Panic ensued around the world. In fact, when I came back from a tour of West Africa, my own friends in our neighborhood were questioning whether I should go to the kids' soccer game that weekend. And I understood why, because fear had taken over from data. But President Obama stayed extraordinarily hyper-focused on making data-driven decisions. When people wanted to shut down air traffic between West Africa and the United States, he kept it open so that our response could be effective. When humanitarians couldn't go safely, he sent in the military to create the opportunity for a global scaled response. And we did a variety of things throughout the response that made a huge difference. Some people thought you had to treat every patient in an Ebola treatment unit, and that's how you cut transmission. We actually found 70% of all cases of transmission were children and mothers and grandparents hugging, kissing, washing, and respecting the bodies of those who had died. We put burial teams together that in full protective gear eliminated that as a major vector of transmission. In many cases, people were, especially locally, hiding and hoarding data. You know, it's not popular to be the county that has Ebola in your country. So it's hard to extract and make that information visible. At the same time, many international partners were wildly exaggerating the number of total cases that would occur to make news and get attention. We put in place modern diagnostics. We sent epidemiologists from Sweden and Johns Hopkins who were able to build a real-time data system that showed us where the cases were, as soon as we knew they were laboratory-confirmed positives. And we saw too many patients were healthcare workers and family members dying from trying to be supportive to those who were in need. Often, when they took their protective equipment off, they would infect themselves. So I gave it a shot in Sierra Leone to see if I could get the gear on and off. And in fact, I struggled. Had I been in the hot zone, treating patients, I would have infected myself despite getting trained properly. 
So we redesigned the suit that health workers would wear with bigger faces so you could see who was treating you and a safer doffing process so you could get out of it fast and safely. The data tell the story on what happened. The total number of cases came down faster and more aggressively than anyone would have imagined. Ebola has been eliminated from Liberia and I'm confident will be handled in remaining countries throughout West Africa. And we don't worry about it nearly as much today. All of these cases have proven to me that we have the data, technology, innovation, and capacity to be the world's effective leader in humanitarian affairs. But I also observed in my five years leading USAID that, in fact, it takes more than data and it takes more than technology. This is a photo of my wife with my six-year-old daughter, Amna, on the moment after her successful ballet recital a few weekends ago here in Washington, DC. I looked around the room in the audience and saw hundreds of parents and family members so proud and compassionate and loving towards their kids. And I asked myself, could we have that same compassion towards all children? The girl on the other side of the photograph from South Sudan, her mother loves her just as much as Shivam loves Amna. But in fact, she's more likely to die in childbirth than complete a high school education. And so I ask you, can we all have the same compassion for all the world's children and do a better job of ensuring that we build a brighter future for that little girl as well. Thank you.